to talk tonight about progress with uh, global tree conservation. And um, first of all, when there are so many species and so many aspects of biodiversity that are in trouble that need conservation attention, so many big environmental issues, why should we be concerned about tree species? Why should we prioritise trees for conservation action? Well, to me it's self-evident, and I'm sure to all of you in this room as well, uh, you recognise the importance. I mean, they, trees provide us with a huge range of major natural resources. Uh, the global production of timber products alone is uh, $480 million do billion dollars per year. And then you think of all the fuel wood, the fibre, fruits and nuts, all the whole range of uh, products that are derived from trees, which are of immense importance to us. And the ecological value, again, I don't think I need to um, explain that, but the role of trees uh, in sequestering carbon, producing of nearly half the world's oxygen, major structural component of all our ecosystems. I mean, trees are absolutely fundamentally important. And as we increasingly uh, are damaging our ecosystems, we need the species diversity to restore ecosystems and we need the diversity of trees to do that. Uh, and many of our tree species are threatened with extinction. So I mean, trees are awesome, they're immensely important, but I think in a way they have a bit of an image problem, certainly in terms of conservation with the popular uh, imagination. We take trees for granted. Um, it's so much easier to be concerned about animals and uh, somehow trees seem to be a little bit ignored and just we just assume that they'll always be there. Uh, but we are destroying the uh, diversity of tree species worldwide and in common with all other species, um, the, the threats are the same, basically. The, 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 the degree of threat will, will obviously vary, but habitat loss is the major threat to tree species worldwide. Uh, Overexploitation, particularly for logging, is a, a huge problem. Invasive species is a growing problem and one which is really not very well understood with the huge uh, increase in pests and diseases uh, affecting trees worldwide. Pollution and then of course overall on top of all that climate change and as we know when species are in trouble as a consequence of climate change they can either migrate, they can adapt for trees, that takes a long time, or they face extinction and we are seeing increasing evidence of the impact of global climate change on, species, on the threats to species. So the initiative, one of the initiatives that I'm very much involved in at present is the Global Tree Assessment. And uh, this uh, aims to collect information on the conservation status of all the world's tree species by 2020, which is alarmingly close. Um, it's nearly here, so we've got to keep going with it. But uh, it's, a, it's a major effort involving a partnership primarily between Botanic Gardens Conservation International and the Global Tree Specialist Group of, of IUCN Species Survival Commission. So um, some of you may be familiar with BGCI, Botanic Gardens Conservation International. It's basically it's the global network of botanic gardens that are committed to working together to conserve plant diversity um, and undertake education projects. Specifically in relation to the Global Tree Assessment, the, 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 um, the BGCI provides the secretariat for the IUCN Global Tree Specialist Group. It's also a member of the IUCN Red List Partnership. So like other organisations like the Zoological Society of London, BirdLife, Royal Botanic Gardens Q, and a few other organisations, they've all committed to supporting the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. 
Um, and BG Share is also a, a partner in the Global Trees campaign with Fauna and Flora International. And I'll be talking about that um, shortly. So now at BGCI, there is a really enthusiastic, committed and focused core team of people who spend all their day red listing tree species, collecting the information, uh, sending species out for review, working with partners around the world to get all this information in place, hopefully by the end of um, 2020. The Global Tree Specialist Group is, is the uh, group that I currently co-chair. Uh, this was set up uh, uh, in, in 2003 and originally it had its secretariat at Fauna and Flora International. And, and it was set up uh, really to maintain information on threatened trees, in, take the lead in promoting red listing for trees, and then also to try and campaign to save trees. And then when I moved to, from Fauna and Flora International to Botanic Gardens Conservation International, we moved the Global Tree Specialist Group Secretariat to BGCI. And now there's around 100 members who are um, tree experts, foresters, herbarium botanists, working sort of on a, essentially a voluntary basis. And if anyone loves trees and wants to join, you're most welcome. And our, really our fundamental priority is uh, to, to get on with the red listing job. Um, so to assess all the tree species for their, 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 their threat status and then record what the threats are and record what needs to happen to secure the trees. So going back in time, I thought I'd just sort of explain a little bit about how I came to be involved in, in this global tree conservation work. Um, so at the first um, United Nations Conference on the Human Environment uh, was held in 1972 and I was, in, I was at school in the sixth form still and I was really enthusiastic when I heard about this. I thought, gosh, that's what I want to do, you know, I want to be involved in, in international conservation and, I, and I, I don't know why but it just really got me quite um, intrigued and I wanted to get involved in some form of international conservation. And I'd, I'd grown up in Derbyshire, always like going out of the countryside, looking at plants. Wasn't interested in bird watching. I didn't know the bird watchers till quite a lot later, actually. And I thought they were weird. I thought, anyone, <laughs> I thought everyone would love plants. And I didn't know that people were interested in birds or other, other aspects of wildlife. Um, so I went off to university in London, had a fantastic time, thoroughly enjoyed it. And then... Um, after, the, after my undergraduate degree, I had to try and find a job or do a PhD, couldn't quite decide which. Um, I, I found this letter recently, which was a basically a, I'd, I'd sent an inquiry to the Nature Conservancy Council and got a rejection, a light rejection, saying, um, in the current national economic circumstances, the NCC doesn't expect to recruit. And I thought, well, what, you know, it's the same old story, isn't it? There's never enough funding for conservation, but um, I didn't give up hope. But of course, at the time, there were many other distractions in London in the 70s. It was a great time for uh, going to see bands. And so my heart wasn't really in an academic career, and I didn't pursue the PhD that I started. And then I was incredibly lucky. Um, in, after, after doing a couple of years of, of um, work on, on Scottish peat bogs, but always coming back to London in time for the music gigs, um, I was incredibly lucky in 1979 to see a job advertised in the New Scientist uh, for a conservation officer uh, to work at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. And uh, so I applied. I, no, I, I didn't know much about taxonomy. I'd only been to Kew once for a casual visit. I didn't know much about the place, but I thought it sounded quite you know, worth a go. And I got the job. Um, and it was a really exciting time uh, to be working at Kew because I think it was it was still sort of late seventies. 
there was a really strong feeling that botanic gardens had to get more involved in, in conservation and uh, they were very actively involved in, 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 in red listing, the early assessment of, of the conservation status of, of plants um, and they, the botanic gardens came together um, in a coordinating body which was launched in 1979, the same month as I joined uh, Q and there's this IUCN Threatened Plants Committee. So lots of the botanists were all working together on red listing, uh, finding out where trees or plants were being grown in botanic gardens, and and uh, it was quite an exciting time. So there we all were thinking that we could save the world and save all plant species, and uh, and having quite a lot of fun at the same time. And my particular role was at Q in that time was to um, act as the, uh, to, to under coordinate the work that Q undertook as scientific authority for CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, and also to red list the species um, that were covered under the Convention. So uh, I was taken under the wing of the cactus experts at Q and spent a lot of time finding out about how threatened different cacti were in the wild. And uh, then after five years at Kew, I uh, left and went into the world of freelance. Uh, I carried on with my interest of, in interested cacti and succulent, succulent plants. And I did a few um, uh, undercover surveys of the cactus trade going around nurseries in Europe to see which of the nurseries were selling illegally imported rare cacti. So that was quite an adventure. Um, and increasingly I was thinking that um, the, the, if we're think, thinking about the impact of trade on any plant species, it's got to be the timber trade that we ought to be looking at. And um, I wrote uh, a little report for uh, IUCN on rare tropical timbers, and that turned into uh, a proposal to the newly formed International Tropical Timber Organization to do a study on the conservation status of tropical timbers in trade. Uh, when that came out, that's, that, that, the results of that study, when they were published in, in 1991, they went down with a, like a lead balloon with ITTO, the International Tropical Timber Organization. They didn't want to hear that any tropical timbers could be negatively impacted as a result of commercial trade in the species. So it was kind of, they tried to shelve it. But the Dutch government uh, took an interest in that study and said, we will support you through, well, we will support a project at the UNEP, uh, at UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Centre to look further into the conservation status of trees. And so um, we did the first assessment of how rare tree species were. And that uh, the World List of Threatened Trees was published uh, back in 1998. And, and it was a big fat telephone directory and listing all the scientific names of the tree species with a short paragraph of what the issues were and, and the conservation rating. And I thought, well, it's going to be a huge shame if, we, if that just sits there as a reference document. And, and it's nobody takes any, nobody uses it, or nobody really looks at how we can make a difference using that information. And so um, I talked to various different organisations, and Fauna and Flora International said, "Well, let's you know come and come and work for Fauna and Flora International, and let's do something to try and use the information to save trees." And so we set up the. Um, Global Trees campaign uh, 20 years ago now. Um, initially it was with FFI and UNEP WCMC and then it moved from UNEP WCMC were 
were not really so interested in, in tree species and so it, it moved to um, BCI and it's now a joint campaign run by BGCI and FFI. And the whole idea all along was to try and keep the information on the conservation status of tree species up to date and then use that to prioritise action and then to try and raise funding to actually save a few tree species from extinction. Uh, so it was really the whole, whole idea was to try and link information into planning and then conservation action for different groups of tree species. Um, when we started the Global Trees campaign, there was no allocated funding for it. Um, so it was just a case of, yeah, let's you know save all the world's tree species, but we haven't got really any resources. So within FFI, first of all, we looked to see what FFI was already doing and in various forestry projects, usually um, set up initially to save a gibbon or um, an elephant or you know one of those charismatic animals, but there was a forestry component and we thought it would be a good way to connect and look, about, look at some of the trees that were in the forest that we could conserve. And we also thought about, well, let's focus on uh, some uh, charismatic species and um, and we, we managed to use some of the funding from a new fund which was established with money from uh, Department of Environment, the Flagship Species Fund. And so uh, an initial focus was on the lovely magnolia species because we thought they'll make nice flagship species. People are familiar with magnolias, they know what you're talking about and they're beautiful. So. Um, in total, there are around 300 magnolia species in the wild. Um, we now know that uh, half of those species are threatened with extinction, and around another, th and around a third of all species are still insufficiently known. So we can't really assign a conservation category. And these are really ancient. A really ancient family of flowering plants that you know in the in the late Cretaceous and Tertiary era they'd probably be growing around here. You know they were widespread throughout the northern hemisphere. They are great survivors. They now survive in um, uh, there's two main centres of diversity. One in southeast uh, in, in East Asia and in, in China, and the other in the Americas. So half of these species are threatened with extinction. Uh, this is Magnolia wilsonii, which is a vulnerable species in China. Um, that is called Magnolia syrinthornii, uh, and it's only known from a small patch of about 30 square kilometers in Thailand, and so it's endangered. Um, uh, this is another Chinese magnolia that's only known from Guangxi. Uh, it's called Magnolia sinostellata, and it, this is one of the species that uh, has we've been focusing on for uh, conservation through the Global Trees Campaign. About there've been about there are around twenty magnolia species that we've taken specific action to um, to conserve in the wild, working with local partners in uh, various uh, parts of the world. And so this one, um, it's been mainly about, you know, propagation in local nurseries and then trying to reinforce the local populations and also uh, boosting some uh, nursery production for sale for ornament, for, as, as a local ornamental tree to, to relieve, re, relieve the pressure on the wild plants because people were just dig, digging them up for their own gardens. And so that's uh, working with a couple of botanic gardens in, in China on that particular project. And another magnolia, so half the magnolias are in, in China and that um, and, 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 and that and adjacent countries, Vietnam, Thailand, and then 
the other half are in the Americas, and this is uh, Magnolia cubensis, which is endemic to uh, Cuba, surprisingly enough, and that's a species <coughs> that we've also been involved in conservation of. So it was really trying to, initially it was looking at um, attractive species that people might might have some interest in because they were familiar with at least the, the genus. You know, most people would know what a, a magnolia is and that sort of helped with fundraising. Uh, likewise with this um, very rare species of camellia, um, which is another Chinese species which has been very heavily um, poached from the wild for the horticultural trade. And again, that was a case of sort of propagating it in lo local nurseries and reinforcing the natural populations and also working with local communities to grow it so that they could then sell it and take the pressure off the wild populations. Um, like, like, likewise with rhododendrons, there's about a thousand species of rhododendrons around the world and about 300 of those species are threatened with extinction and um, the, the good news in a way is that about um, three quarters of the threatened species are in at least a documented collection somewhere in a botanic garden so there is the potential to work with botanic gardens to then reach out to local communities, uh, nature reserves and support conservation and that is happening increasingly with rhododendrons because they formed a global rhododendron consortium of different uh, organisations that are interested in trying to make sure that all the species are uh, protected. Same with oaks, so here we're, we've been working with the Morton Arboretum in Chicago um, the Morton Arboretum is looking at assessing all the oaks of the world and uh, they, they started off with the oaks of North America, looking at their conservation status. Uh, there are, I think there are about 91 species in the US, of which about half are endemic and 16 are threatened. And uh, this particular species, Quercus arcansia, Kansiana uh, is very fragmented and so the uh, reproduction, re regeneration, reproduction, regeneration of the species is really uh, hindered in the wild. So the more that the consortium of botanic gardens have been trying to propagate and boost the population of the species. But one of the problems with this species and many other oaks, uh, particularly in the southwest, um, the southern part of the USA is uh, that they are um, really impacted by climate change and, and the impact that has on their habitat. So this species is, is predicted to lose 60% of its suitable habitat uh, based on modelling um, as a result of climate change. So if the botanic gods take these species into, into their collections and propagate them, with the long-term aim of getting them back into the wild, well, you know, where will the wild be and where will they put them? So that's quite a, a challenge, but at least that some action is being taken at that level. Um, I thought I would show at least one uh, European threatened tree. So this is Zalkova, a Zalkova species, uh, which is uh, severely threatened in Crete. Uh, and it's another species that Global Trees Campaign has been trying to help save, working with a range of local partners. Um, overgrazing is the main problem, and so really fencing has been one of the only sort of practical um, ways to try and um, help this species to, buy, to survive. I mean, you can, you, know, can, you can propagate it, grow it, but still in the wild, if everything's being eaten, then you've got to sort of uh, keep the livestock out. And of course, we have to do something about Madagascar bearbabs because they are so iconic. So that's uh, another uh, group of species that FFI has been working on through the Global Trees Campaign. Um, 
conifers as well. Uh, this one, Abies zeuensis, is known from only about four little sites in China, about 600 mature individuals, and it was only described as a species uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And it's thought that it had a, was a, had a much more widespread distribution, but because of logging and general forest clearance, it's reduced to small fragments. So again, it's something that's being um, propagated, reinforced. And again, it's another species which has uh, been taking major steps to keep reduced grazing pressures. Um, and another tree species, which is uh, this another species that uh, is um, this one is a, it occurs in China. It is also has a very very small population in Vietnam, and it's the Chinese coffin tree, which produces a nicely scented wood that the Chinese like for making coffins out of, and it has declined significantly because of that use. Um, so it's another species that uh, FFI has been working with to work with local communities and a local conservation agency to uh, boost the uh, natural population. Take a long time for the little uh, saplings to grow to a big enough size to be felled for timber but at least it's doing something uh, positive moving forward. And the lovely uh, monkey puzzle tree, which uh, is uh, found only in Chile and Argentina and uh, is relatively well protected, but it is, in it is considered to be endangered. And unfortunately, that's one of the species which now is being impacted by some form of new disease, which no one is quite sure what it is or what, it, what where it's come from. So. Um, I just think that's such a lovely tree. Uh, and then the, another Araucaria, another uh, related tree, this one is, um, <coughs> occurs in, this is the piranha pine, and it occurs in um, southern Brazil and adjacent areas of Paraguay and Argentina. Uh, it's considered to be critically endangered because it has de its population has <coughs> declined by 90% over the past century as a result of uh, logging. It was one. It was a really important timber species. Um, actually, I remember um, when we were doing up an old house where I used to live. We were offered a staircase made out of piranha pine, and I thought. No, can't, can't go anywhere near it. I didn't know at that time that it was critically endangered, but that's how it is currently listed. Um, but that is, um, there's a really nice project. Uh, I think probably the, the, the best of all the Global Trees campaign projects, uh, working with a local partner called Sociedad Sure, and they are propagating the Ara that Araucaria species, but also a range of about a hundred other local trees, about 30 of which are threatened with extinction in the wild. And they are making those species available for restoration, and they're working with other nurseries in the area, and so they're now supplying trees uh, of, a, of a, a wide mix for replanting, for restoration of the forest involving businesses and university students, local NGOs. So it's really a great integrated project. We started out with the interest in the, the Araucaria, but has now, uh, they've now incorporated a lot of other tree species in the mix. So they're really providing um, a good mix of trees for restoration purposes. So there's a lot going on, uh, a lot of small-ish, medium tree conservation projects. At the same time as doing all that, we would try, we've been trying to keep the information on 
threatened trees up to date. And originally, we took a quite an opportunistic approach. Whenever we got a bit of money, we'd say, oh, let's do a red list of rhododendrons or uh, trees of Central Asia, if there, was, if there was someone interested in working with us, and we had a bit of funding. Um, and we produced 10 different reports. Uh, we worked quite a bit with the University of Bournemouth, and they had PhD students doing some of these studies, and then we'd get uh, regional experts together. Some of the information made it onto the IACN Red List, some of it sort of stayed in these reports, but it was quite useful to guide the work of botanic gardens as well in tree conservation. And then in 2015, we decided, well, let's get strategic. Um, well, in fact, a little bit before that. So we published a paper in Oryx uh, towards a global tree assessment. And then this is really when we decided, OK, we're going to try and really focus and have a big effort to get all the trees assessed by 2020. So the first thing we did was to prepare a baseline list of all tree species. And amazingly, that had never been done before. So there's lots of checklists of plant species or taxonomic lists of species, but not um, trees across all the different botanical families. Uh, so we thought we'd have that start with that baseline list. We then thought, we'll, we'll identify the species that are not threatened, and then we'll kind of remove those from our consideration. We'll collect enough information and document the fact that these are really widespread, and um, we don't need to be too troubled about them, for now at least. And then we'll work on how to prioritise the remaining trees, which are more likely to be threatened, because they're probably just found in one country, or they've already been included in a national red list, or their timber species, and we'll, we'll develop partnerships um, to get those listed. So, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to go back and I've lost the way. But anyway, this is the, this is just you know detail really. But we, so in looking at the national endemics, we. Um, figured out that if you take the, the, the countries with the largest amount of trees and the largest number of endemic trees, then you get, you get a list in total of around um, 25,000 endemic trees. And then we've been trying to work with partners in each of those countries to assess the tree species. And so the overall process, we have the list of... Um, 60,000 tree species um, in an online database called Global Tree Search, and that gives the distribution at a country level. And then at the mo at currently, 51 tree species have a conservation assessment, either on the IUCN Red List or in a national equivalent. So you could say we're halfway there, we've got just over a year to do the other half, which is a bit of a challenge, but you know, we'll, we'll keep going. And so far, we now estimate that 20% of trees are threatened with extinction. One of the big challenges, and I think this is a, you know, one potential research question is, we haven't been very good at assessing trees on the basis of the rate of exploitation. We've mainly done it looking at the uh, the distribution of the tree and what's happening to the forest within its range, rather than directly linking information on production and trade and population decline. So that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge. Uh, when we have all this information, we, want, we, we use it to influence global and national policy, whether it's CITES, um, <coughs> which currently lists, um, I think it's about... Um, 600 tree species, about 580 tree species, and 308 of those are timber species. But there's a lot more um, species which are which are potentially could be listed under under CITES, and we need basic information on their threat status. Um, not only timber species, but also medicinal species like uh, Prunus africana. Um, and then there's the used to support the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
and specifically uh, the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which has a series of different um, targets which should theoretically be met by the end of 2020. So our um, uh, assessment of the conservation status of all tree species meet, helps to meet target two for plants. Um, and conservation action, which is what it's all about. And of course, tree species ideally protecting them in their natural habitats and tackling the threats. But there is also the backup of exit to conservation. The target um, through the uh, CBD target, through the global strategy for plant conservation, is to have at least 75% of threatened plant species and ex situ collections. And currently, about 26% of all trees are threatened trees are known to be ex situ collections. Um, but of course, that's not that's not really effective conservation, um, and that's where the Willingby pine, which is critically endangered, should, uh, should be uh, helped to flourish. Um, seed banking is a very efficient and uh, cost-effective way of storing material, plant material for conservation purposes, but a lot of the tree species can't be, can't be stored in that way. The seeds are known as recalcitrant and they, they will not be seed banked. So, for example, all the oaks can't be stored in that way, and a lot of tropical trees can't either. Uh, when, when using the material from the ex situ collections, restoration of ecosystems is critically important to uh, conserve tree diversity um, and, and, and build up resilience to uh, tackle with the impact of climate change. And that's where a lot of the small projects through the Global Trees campaign are helping. So this guy, uh, Luis Roberto, is working on the magnolian, um, the, the, the Cuban magnolia that I mentioned earlier, and working with that and a range of other tree species, working with local coffee farmers uh, and small scale local nurseries, again, to grow the threatened trees and replant them in the wild as part of restoration projects. And uh, we're also uh, doing that with the Turu Botanic Garden in uh, Uganda, where uh, they, are they are restoring former eucalyptus plantations using a mix of native species, and including things like, this is a, a 15-year-old plantation of Crudus africana, the medicinal tree, uh, within the Turu Botanic Garden. This was taken uh, a few years ago now. Uh, it's underplanted with another medicinal uh, plant that the local people really uh, favour. Um, but in the, re in the restoration of the, uh, the replanting of the former eucalyptus sites, uh, they're, they're providing a mix of endangered species and species which will have li livelihood value so that people actually do benefit from uh, having the, growing the trees that they find most useful. Um, the targets, the CBD targets relating to international trade in endangered species and wild harvested uh, plants being su produced sustainably, I think we've got a long way to go with that and I think this is where there's a real uh, problem. I mean, uh, with, if you think about forest certification, which supposedly shows, you know, certification of sustainable management of forests, 10% um, of the world's forests are certified as sustainably managed now, but 50% of the sustainably managed forests are in, sorry, 90% of sustainably managed forests are in temperate regions and 50% are in um, Canada and the United States. So only 2% of tropical forests are certified as sustainably managed. So there's a huge, huge problem in um, unsustainable and illegally sourced 
timber, and that clearly has an impact on the conservation status of tree species. So, uh, I'm sorry, I've come, seem to have covered a, an awful lot of trees in a short space of time. <laughs> <laughs> but there are 60,000 of them, and if I, I could have shown you a photo, if I'd tried to show you a photograph of every one, we would have felt. No, don't worry. Um, are we making progress in, 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 in tree conservation? I, I keep thinking about this. But I don't know, really. Um, <laughs> There is, we are improving the information base, but it's still, you know, pretty basic. There is a, there's broad policy framework, there's international conventions, that I'm sure you're all familiar with, CITES, CBD, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, there are, you know, successful, <laughs> <laughs> successful small scale, projects, examples of you know, individual efforts, working all around the world to save, in small, uh, to save single tree species. And I think, there are, I think there are opportunities, and I don't know how to, I think this is something to, that we have to think about going forward, I don't, don't know how to do it, but there's so much, there is, there is increased interest in the environment, there is more interest in forest conservation and you know, the, the, the concern about what's happening to the Amazon. Um, there's a lot of tree planting going on. Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily focus on the right species and it misses an opportunity by not incorporating threatened and endangered trees within the planting. And there is, you know, there's a huge um, a growing awareness that we need to do something about climate change. So I think there is an opportunity to, to, to link tree conservation more effectively in with some of these other big um, conservation agenda issues, but I don't know how to do it, so that's something for all you people to think about. I'm very willing to try and help. But I, generally, I think we need much more research. I think we need to I, I suppose we need to sort of increase public awareness, although, well, we do. Um, and then we need to raise more funds and, and support and then, you know, take more action. So, yes, maybe. And I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much. And I'm very happy to answer any questions.